we're kind of late starting anyways, so this is Kai and Stefan. Uh, give it up. Okay, that, so much for the embarrassing part. Um, sorry. Um, so this is Stefan, and he is doing IT security at Darmstadt University, um, and is basically concerned with a technological concept on privacy by design. So you don't have to mess around with all the lawyers, and so that would be the idea. But you ensure by technology that uh, privacy and confidentiality, confidentiality, anyway, is preserved. Yeah, and this is Kai. He's uh, working in a computational biology group. He's um, the main topic of research is uh, bioinformatics and large-scale simulation of systems. And that's the reason why we're giving this talk jointly. Right. Okay, so what is TDR, telecommunications data retention? Um, well, the first look in, you know, the storage of world wisdom, Wikipedia, tells you um, that you're probably in the wrong lecture hall. Um, so make sure that you're interested in that. So telecommunications data retention refers to the storage of call detail records which is basically, you know, the telephone numbers, um, the duration of the call, the time when the call was made, and so on. And uh, in the case of government data retention, it's basically what we are talking about, not about, you know, data mining for, uh, from companies, but really governmental uh, data retention. The data that is stored is usually for telephone calls made and received, email sent and received, and websites visited. So it's basically about communication in a very broad sense. And there were uh, actually a lot of narratives why TDRs are necessary. Um, and at least in Germany, the predominant reason, or well, stated reason to do that was this guy and his um, you know, fellow terrorists. Um, there are a lot of other speculations. So for example, going for people um, you know, who play a funny game that actually <coughs> you know, inspired the, to uh, the talk's title. Um, or, you know, to preserve the business model of some industries from the last millennium and, you know, to ensure monopoly rents. Or, uh, at least in Germany now, these days, we hear a lot about weird pictures that, you know, then are discussed on TV, that then, you know, if the bad people distributing those pictures. But whatever the speculations, we really, you know, take it at face value what, what people argued when they introduced TDRs, um, why that is absolutely necessary for our well-being. <clears throat> so, in all these discussions and in all these arguments, um, there are actually two directions completely mixed up. And that's the first thing we would like, you know, to separate. That is the thing, is something after an incident, so is it a post-analysis, or is it something, you know, preventive to extract some knowledge, some pre-crime idea, right, to identify potential people who might potentially, and so on, do something. And indeed, it is a case that the post-incident analysis actually works. Um, so you can obviously dig into telecommunicator, uh, so these call detailed records, and look what's going on. So actually, this is the network of the 9-11 terrorists um, that was reconstructed by the FBI without telecommunication, telecommunications data retention, actually. Um, and the, the funny thing is, uh, it's basically a static or more or less a static uh, picture that emerges. So you go into this graph or network and look who is communicating with whom or has communicated with whom. Um, it is the after effect analysis and there are very, very sophisticated data input or imports uh, these days and adapters to various databases. Might it be Twitter, Facebook, blah, 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 telecommunication, web search engines, whatever. But the, the funny part is that it's still highly, highly manual. So you do visual inspection and navigation. There's no really automatic thing to do. Um, and most uh, importantly, 
This can be done by quick freeze. So the police or the law enforcement agencies go to the carrier and say, hey, freeze the data. There was a terrorist attack, right? We would like to know that guy that blew himself up, who was he communicating with? And this static picture is completely you know, achievable with quick freeze. And if you want to see what you can achieve, even as a private citizen, uh, I recommend that talk by Chris on the DEF CON. Um, and he actually shows in his talk, by this post incident analysis, if you wish, um, that the static picture actually can give you, you know, money, your money back if you fall for one of the Nigeria scams, uh, because he identified, just by Twitter, Facebook, blah, 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 um, the people in Nigeria who took some money and called them. Um, that was a surprise. So <clears throat> social network analysis, again, after the fact, works. There is basically, you know, that's reality. And this distinction between post-analysis and preemptive you know, analysis that might reveal some plot that might kill people, that is really important. And <clears throat> again, it's useful for the post-incident uh, analysis, obviously. Then you have a lot of data and you can really you know, see who was conspiring with whom. <clears throat> However, and that is now a private opinion, um, it doesn't seem really proportionate because you can do that with quick freeze anyway. So why save 82 million people in Germany's um, communications patterns um, when you can achieve this line or this, you know, uh, this line of, of work uh, without it, just by the quick freeze, met quick freeze method? Um, proactive, so you know, identifying reliably um, people who might kill someone is, from our point of view, proportionate. And then probably it's also okay to, you know, save all the data. Um, but the question remains, is it really useful? Because if it's useful and works, then that might be a reason to really be in favor of TDRs. If it's not uh, really useful, well, you know, <clears throat> then you have the problem. It, it would be nice, but it just doesn't work, so there's no reason to do it then. <clears throat> and that is, this question sign is basically what we are concerned about in this talk, to fill that gap. Um, but that means we have to talk about uh, security in a very rational way um, and not without, uh, without fear, basically. Um, and I would like to recommend, uh, although it's hard to see, that funny or nice uh, YouTube video by Bruce Schneier uh, on, well, basically the philosophy of security and what might be achievable and what might, you know, what might be out of uh, reach. And this very good book, The Science of Fear, which tells you or describes what mechanisms are actually addressed in a crowd like you, you know, to inspire fear and then avoid this rational talk and probably science-based um, evaluation of <coughs> security measures? Okay, so what, what are we actually, what, what is the setup that we see? Well, on the one hand, we have the innocent law-abiding citizen, which from now on I will call ILEC. Um, so it's this nice, happy guy, right, <coughs> earning his living in a big, big city or in a big community of people. And then there, there are the bad terrorists. Um, most of you might know this character from already shooting him in the head, right? Okay, so this is the network. And these guys form those networks and these guys, you know, form a huge network. And they somehow are immersed in that huge network and do their thing. Okay, the problem is we don't have any real data at that point, um, for obvious reasons, privacy concerns, um, the telecommunications people just don't reveal that, and police agencies probably don't have really an incentive, you know, to have uh, an evaluation at that point. So, <clears throat> but there are a lot of papers available on the statistics of those networks, so of the ILEC network, I have to say, and on the terror network on the other hand. So the terror network is really, there are several papers from the uh, embassy bombings, from the 9-11 attacks, from the Madrid bombings, blah, blah, blah. And they are even, uh, you know, uh, annotated by names of the people. So we know a lot of the, uh, of the topologies and so on, and we know statistics from the crowd, basically. Um, and there is a slide missing. Not. <coughs> Sorry. Um, okay, so we know a lot of statistics, and for example, we know that the degree, which is the number of communications partners um, in the communication uh, uh, network, just decreases <coughs> uh, 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 in a scale free law, um, and we could repeat that. Um, then there is something like the neighbor degree correlation, which tells, which tells you. Um, 
if, if I have a degree K, right, what is the average degree of my communications partners? So this is something like, or you can r really see kind of a hierarchy or a chain of command here. Because in real communications networks, um, a high degree for myself comes with a high degree of the average communication partner of mine. So that means there are a lot of people who have only, you know, two or three contacts, and these people also only have two, three, four contacts. But the highly connected people have a lot of, or know a lot of people who are also highly connected, and this uh, property is called assortative uh, uh, neighboring. And then we know something about the communications patterns, that is, for example, the call durations, so how long does it take to transfer the information to make the call in relation to the degree, and you see there's basically a constant, and we can also model that with our setup. So we are in agreement with all the statistics that are known, and that means <coughs> we, have, we know the topology by the statistics um, from the ILEX, and we know from several papers the statistics or the, uh, the topology of the terrorists. At the same time, we know the communication patterns of the normal people, by uh, also these statist published statistics, but we, what we really don't know is if the communications patterns, so in, in, in the kind of how long does it take to call someone, and so on. Uh, if, if this is different for someone plotting um, a terror attack. Okay, uh, but that is the same situation law enforcement agencies would face, right? Because they don't know either if the terrorists are so completely different in their communications patterns. So what we do here is we just average over a lot of different scenarios because that is what the law enforcement people would have to do anyway. So although we lack this knowledge, um, that's actually good because we figured out that we then resemble the situation a police officer faces. Okay, just some technical background. We did some C++, a discrete event simulation on agent-based patterns, so ILEX or terrorists, right? There's a very nice graph tool available um, um, for Python, and the statistical analysis was done with R, which is basically in bioinformatics the choice of you know, analysis platform. Um, well, extreme programming, blah, blah, blah. Um, these are the papers that, were, uh, that publish these topologies and communications behaviors. Um, and then comes now the question, what are we actually measuring? And um, there is, you can make a distinction. There is one-point and two-point measures that actually tell you something about one point in the network, so one person, or two point, so two persons, but then it tells you something about one communication event. So it's always about, you know, either an edge or a node in the network. And there is, for example, the number of calls per day, the number of distinct communications partners per day, the clustering coefficient, which is a network measure that tells you how highly connected are my neighbors, right? So the clustering coefficient gives you an estimate of, say, something like the density or uh, an impression of a hierarchy, of a potential hierarchy in the network. Then you can normalize that by the number of calls. If you make more calls, right, then probably you just, by, by chance, you end up with someone highly connected. You can no normalize that by the information transfer, which we call IA, which is in uh, telephones proportional to, you know, the number of minutes probably, or in web traffic, it's just the kilobytes or gigabytes. <coughs> in other applications. Um, you can normalize then the transferred information uh, by the link degree because, you know, if, if you have a hierarchy, a chain of command, then you obviously transfer to the head of the plot uh, something, you know, more information because he has to gather that and coordinate things um, by the clustering coefficient and so on and so on. And then there are three-point measures. And these are now the interesting ones um, because these involve three people and a consecutive chain so a temporal order of communications events between the persons i, j, and k. And now we look at covariances. So is the, a degree, the, the, the degree of j somewhat correlated to the one of k, right? That tells you if there would be a hierarchy, say, wh uh, whether i is reporting to some guy who is then reporting to the next guy. Um, then the deg degree distribution between sender and receiver um, over that whole chain. Um, the clustering coefficient, again, but now whether they are correlated. So it's not just, you know, the clustering coefficients of that guy, but whether this correlation coefficient, a uh, clustering coefficient is correlated with this clustering coefficient, and so on. Um, and then we also look on the information transfer. Um, most of all, if, say, this information amount is larger than that one, 
which would indicate, you know, that there is additional information or might be additional information added to report to that guy. Probably a chain of command, probably not, I don't know, but, you know, at the end, it might be an order, and then this is augmented by detailed instructions how to, you know, drive the car to some place and leave the bomb there, blah, 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 um, and so on. Okay, so we have the one-point measures, which measure uh, quantities about the people. We have two-point measures, which measure quantities of single information transfer. And we have the three-point measure, so three people involved, that measure correlations of the people among each other in these small groups of three people and which measures um, correlations or covariances between um, information transfer between these three people in a temporal order. Okay, that gives rise to distributions. So we get a lot of distributions of you know, all these quantities in the simulation, and now we have to compare that, right, be between something for the terrorist and something for the normal people, because you can only expect to identify a terrorist if somehow his pattern of communication deviates from the normal people. And the standard approach to do that, to do that is the so-called kullback leibler divergence, which is, from those of you who are you know, either computer scientists or physicists or so, um, is kind of a uh, relative entropy. And you have two distributions, P and Q, and then you compute uh, this quantity, and that gives you in bit the difference between the distributions P and Q. Or better to say, that is the amount of information you have to spend to describe P with reference to Q. <clears throat> it has some good properties for our purposes. Um, it's always bigger than zero, or it's equal zero, so we know a lower bound, right? And it's only zero, and only, if the two distributions are the same. So if there is really, you know, equality or correspondence in the distributions, um, that is not, the third property is not so important for our purposes here. Okay. This has to be, you don't have to read that, um, but this is the fundamental theorem that is basic, the basis of our study, and that is the Schern of Steinlemmer, which tells you roughly what is the false positive rate. And the false positive rate, it's given here, is basically the kullback leipzig divergence and a sign in front of it. Okay, so whenever the kullback leipzig divergence between two distributions is large, then, you know, you get a small false positive rate, which you would like to achieve with limited uh, police uh, uh, resources, right? You cannot just send to every household that you falsely identified or predicted to be a terrorist one. Um, you cannot send a police officer there. So you want to have this thing very, very big. What we now want to do is to comparing the distributions for the terrorists and for the normal people, and we have a distribution of the indicator variable, is this guy a terrorist, which we know because we simulate everything, right? So we have complete control, but pretend to not know it at that point. <clears throat> and the distribution of the, all these measures that we uh, acquire during the simulation. And the right thing to, to, to refer to the distribution is the independent distribution. That means there is no correlation or no, no connection between the distribution who is a terrorist and or a normal citizen and the distribution of whatever measure we are talking about. And that means, well, if this is large, um, right, then we have some deviation from the independence assumption and that would be good because then there is a signal that we can identify and get some terrorist, probably. Okay, independence means that a distribution which involves two variables for two different events is actually just the product of the single distributions. And if you plug that in into the kullback leibler divergence formula, you end up with that guy, and that is actually called the mutual information. And that is a quantity that describes how many information I reveal to you, measured in bit, if I tell you, say, the value of x1. So if it's 2.5, right, then I've revealed to you 2.5 bit about the identity of x2 when I give you x1, or vice versa, actually. Okay, that is not the whole story. The problem with that is it depends highly on how you bin the uh, continuous variables we are dealing with, because you have to formulate that on a discrete alphabet, because you just don't have so much data. Um, so if you discretize that, then we're talking entropy and have to take that into account. Here's a short example that I have to give you to understand what we are actually doing. So say you have a data set like that. So whenever x1 is a, x2 is also a, or b, b. So there's a complete, perfect correlation. 
If I tell you x1, you know immediately x2, right? You can work out the numerics and the probabilities by just counting uh, how many appearances of A and B are there, and in the end, the mutual information here between x1 and x2 is one bit, right? If I tell you A, you know immediately x2, because x2 can only two have two values, right? the entropy is also one bit. Differently, uh, the situation is if you have, say, four different symbols. Um, then you have actually a mutual information of two bit, because if I t tell you this is A, then you know W is on the other side, but yeah, well, there are three different other values. So what we have to do is to normalize the mutual information by the entropy of the column that we would like to predict. And the column we would like to predict is, is this guy a terrorist or a normal person? Um, so what in the, in the you know, subsequent slides, we will always show the normalized mutual information, and we have empirical evidence that this is the right measure uh, to use. And that is the mutual information divided by the entropy. And then you see that in both cases, this normalized MI is just one. And that indicates, OK, there is a connection between the two variables. And that is most important to have a unit-free quantity to judge which of the measures we would like to employ is actually the better one. Because there is an overall scale if you do not normalize that. And then you cannot compare which one is better, which of the situations. But if you normalize it, you can do that. OK, and now it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> OK, then let's um, go back one step. Um, let's recall again what we, what we tried to achieve in this, in this work, right? We did this um, simulation. And the purpose was to see whether we realistically are able to distinguish, well, terrorists from non-terrorists in, in a real world telecommunication network. Yeah? Um, so. The first question that we have to ask is, how can we do this, right? I mean, we have to, we have to compute some kind of quantities for, for those ILACs and for those Ts. And uh, Kai has listed on, on this slide like 20 of those quantities. So the first question that we have to ask ourselves is, well, are those quantities actually realistic? Do they tell us anything? Yeah? Um, uh, can we use them to distinguish normal communication behavior from, from some kind of terrorist communication behavior. And I have to admit that we, we made those uh, measures up, right? So this is not something that we got from literature somewhere, but it's, it's, uh, it were measures that seemed reasonable to us and that we started to, um, to just define and actually try. So the first thing that we needed to, uh, well, the first question that we need, needed to answer is which of those 20 measures are actually meaningful? Yeah? So which of those measures are actually tell you something about the difference between ILEX and T's? And to answer this, we made a first experiment. Um, we simulated our communication behavior, so this huge network of both ILEX and T's for a time of, for, for a virtual time of three years, and we computed uh, all those 20 measures, yeah? individually for ILEX and for T's, and we tried to, we tried to compare them. Yeah? And what we did, more precisely, is we computed the mutual information between each of those measures and the flag that indicates whether the person those, uh, that this measure belongs to is a terrorist or not. Yeah? Um, and if, you, if we do this, then you realize that Measures that yield to a high mutual information are the ones that are probably good to distinguish between ILEX and T's because, well, it tells you, you get some kind of information out of the measure on whether this specific uh, person is an ILEX or a T. Uh, so let's dive into the results. How does this work here? Here? No. Here? Yeah, I'm, I'm not used to this, to be honest. Anyway, so what you see here is a graph. On the x-axis, you see all the measures that we, that, that we have defined. On the y-axis, you see what's called the beam plot yeah, of all the measures that we have observed, so of the normalized mutual information between the measure and this flag that indicates whether the person is a, is a terrorist or not. So what is a beam plot? What you see nicely here is uh, essentially the the mean value of all the observations that we had and some kind of um, uh, distribution, so, so an empirical probability distribution of this, of this measure. And it actually means that you see a bump somewhere, well, in a region where we, where we observed many, many of, those, of those values. 
for each measure, you see actually two of those beam plots. So you see one to the left uh, of this vertical line and one to the right of the vertical line. The left one um, <coughs> shows the measures for a community of 150,000 ILEX, and the right one shows uh, uh, the same measure for a community of 600,000 ILEX. And what you see is that essentially those distributions well, are very similar and don't, don't really change much over their population size. And we try to order them according to relevance. So what you see is uh, those measures at the far right, they have a rather high uh, normalized mutual information, which means that those are the most important measures that you will be able to use to distinguish between ILEX and T's. What you also see already here is that those distributions are very nasty yeah, because they have, they have like two, uh, two peaks. And everyone who worked in statistics and did some kind of hypothesis testing in the past knows that um, working with uh, those Two peak distributions can be, can, be rather, can be rather tricky. So we know now that at least those four measures um, have some relevance. Um, uh, but this plot was committed by averaging over all possible values we had. So averaging over all um, uh, community sizes, averaging over all terrorist networks we used and averaging over all, all kind of parameters that we, that, that we introduced. So the next reasonable step was to, to see whether this measure is somewhat stable. Yeah, stable over variations in our parameters. So we've already seen that this measure is more or less stable over the community size. Um, but uh, another interesting question to look at is, is it stable over the retention period? Yeah, so if you employ telecommunications data retention for like half a year or a year or three years, and of course you see different portions of information, and probably there's a, dis there's a difference. Yeah? Um, for example, if you, if you record only, only the communication of a few days, then you will probably miss some links in that, in that, in that graph. If you record the communication for a very, very long uh, time, then you probably uh, get all kind of kind of noise which, which, which um, overlays with your data that, that you actually want to see. So what those two plots show essentially that at least the ranking of those measures does not really depend on the retention period. So the plot on the left shows you the measures for the 90 days retention period. And the plot on the right shows you the same, essentially the same plot, but only for 182 days retention period. You, you can see that those distributions slightly change, but uh, and of course, there's a, there's a bit of bit more noise here in this uh, in this in this uh, uh, graph for the 182 days. But essentially, uh, the ranking of those of those uh, measures is 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 pretty stable. Another thing that we tried um, is uh, another kind of consistency check was the question on binning. So if you compute this normalized mutual information, what you get out is a real value. Yeah? And of course, if you want to plot those empirical distributions uh, on real values, it's, it's going to be a mess. Yeah? And even if you, and if you want to compute this kullback leiber divergence, you want to discretize your, your, uh, your distribution before doing this. So what we did is we, we binned all the values. So we uh, divided the x-axis into like equally spaced regions. and uh, uh, associated all the all the values in one region with with, with the with the center of the bin, yeah? and of course you can. It's now a de, it's now a design decision on of how many bins you use. Yeah? You can use a very low number of bins, like ten, or you can use a very very high number of bins. So we started with with the number of bins uh, set to ten. Um, the reason behind this was that uh, the number of bins shouldn't be too large. So there should be some kind of connection to the size of the terrorist network. So if you, if, you, if you make the number of bins as large as the terrorist networks, then probably, well, uh, you won't observe many terrorist activities in each, and, uh, in each individual bin. Therefore, it makes sense to make a, to make a smaller, smaller bin size. And what we try to see here is whether there is a huge difference uh, on those measures uh, when we look at different binning sizes. So the x-axis again shows the binning sizes that we use, 10, 25, 50, 100. And uh, the y-axis shows essentially an error bar uh, over this uh, uh, normalized mutual information. And what you can see is that there's almost no dependence on binning. Yeah? So all the, all, the, all the graphs are essentially stable. Ah, uh, shit. Yeah, this is the modern time, you know? I mean, 
all kind of stuff happen in the background that you don't want to see. Yeah, and how do, yeah good. Um, another consistency check that, that we made is um, do our measures really depend on the community size? Yeah, so uh, what you see here is, an, is, a, is a plot that shows on the x-axis the size of the, of the ILAC network that we used to embed our T network that ranged from a very, very small network of 50,000 people to, to, uh, to, to a network of 1 million people. Um, and uh, what you can see here is that essentially after some kind of uh, phase where, well, where some random things happen, uh, those values tend to, be, tend to be pretty stable as well. Yeah, so again, this shows us that uh, those uh, measures that we have selected are more or less stable over all kind of parameters that you can actually uh, think of. So I'll only show you two of those graphs. We have lots of more, but I think this, this, this serves the purpose here. So having identified four relevant measures, the next um, experiment that we made is to see What's the influence of the retention period of this measure on this measure? So does it make sense to store telecommunications data for a very, very long time? Or is it more preferable to store it for a short period of time? Because there are two like contradicting forces in action. Right? If you store data for a very limited period of time, then of course you won't see everything. Yeah? So you won't see every, uh, every probably you won't even see every terrorist communicating at w once. Yeah? While if you uh, store data for a very, very long period of time, then you get all kind of noise introduced, yeah? all kind of stochastic effects that, that somehow uh, hide the activities uh, of the T's. And the law enforcement people are actually uh, faced to yeah, solve some kind of needle in the haystack problem. Right? They, have, they have this huge mess of data and, and they have to pick out pick out the right, the right parts, which tends to get more difficult the more data you have, of course. So this experiment um, tried to answer this question, whether it's uh, good to store much data or whether you should restrict the, 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 the size of data that you, that you actually uh, store. So um, we actually did two approaches here. We again committed this uh, mutual information between ILEX and T's, so all the, all the measures and a flag that indicates, uh, well, whether this specific person is an ILAC or T. And we also ha had an alternative measure that directly used this Kuhlberg library divergence. I'm going to show both of you, um, both of them in a minute. So again, you have a very similar plot, one plot for, for every measure. You see on the x-axis now the retention period. We arbitrarily chose uh, a, few, a few values to, uh, uh, well, to to do, to do our, our simulation, so the values range between like a very low ones, seven and, and a year. And what you can see is that there are measures where actually the mutual information goes down, yeah, the more data you uh, store, which is somewhat expected because, again, you introduce much, much more noise into the system and it, it, it gets much more complex to actually distinguish ILACs and T's. And then there are also other measures like this one um, where you more or less see uh, some kind of saturation effect. Yeah? So if you, let's go, let's go to this one for example. Yeah? Here, here you, you see a very prominent saturation effect. Namely, if you, it doesn't really make sense to store more data than, than, than uh, 90 days because, well, the statistics doesn't get better. Yeah? It also doesn't get worse, but it also doesn't get better. What you also see here in those, in those plots is that there is a dependence on, uh, on this F factor. This F factor, if you, if you, if you recall, it was the, was the difference that we introduced uh, in the simulation between Alex and T. So F essentially tells you uh, how much more or how much less the terrorists uh, communicate than an average person. So if, if F is 1.0, then actually there is no difference in communication. If F is smaller, then they communicate less. If F is bigger, they communicate, they communicate more. And you see that uh, also those values actually depend, depend on this F parameter. But again, you see the same, you see the same, uh, you see the same behavior. Yeah? So there are more graphs, but I think I'll, I'll spare this. this the, the, these are just the two more graphs of all the important measures that we, that we chose. Um, so 
What we also did is we tried an alternative approach uh, to rank the important measures. So if you recall what I said like 50 minutes ago, um, is um, in the first experiment we commuted the measure and took the mut normalized mutual information between those measures and this kind of flag that indicates whether a person is a T or not. Um, and uh, what I want to show here is a different experiment that aims actually at showing the same, the same thing. Namely, um, it aims at identifying those measures that are actually important. Yeah? Um, so what we did in the second experiment, again, we simulated uh, our network for, for three years. We commuted all those measures for ILX and Ts. And now we commute it uh, uh, for each measure. We commute the kullberg leibler divergence between the measures of the ILEX and the Ts. Because we, as a simulator, we know this person is a terrorist, this person is not, and we can compute like their distributions and directly compare their distributions by using this uh, kullberg leibler divergence that uh, Kai explained you uh, some slides before. And uh, the bottom line is that this experiment actually yields, yields similar conclusions. Yeah? So if you look at the, at the plot, um, Again, on the x-axis, you see the measures. On the y-axis, you now see the uh, uh, logarithm of the kullberg leibler divergence. And what you would expect is that uh, a measure that's actually good will have a pretty high kullberg leibler divergence, whereas a measure that is bad has a very, very low kullberg leibler divergence. Yeah? So all the points that are somewhat in, the, in, this, in this lower part of this figure they correspond to measures that are actually not very good, yeah, because there's almost no difference between, between uh, terrorists and ELAX, whereas all those measures upwards, they show a pretty big difference between, between ELAX and T, so they are probably better to distinguish those two categories. And as Kai explained to you, uh, um, there's a deep mathematical... Uh, um, 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 yeah... Uh, theorem that, that tells you a connection between this kullberg leibler divergence and the best statistical test that you can do to like, uh, distinguish ILEX and Ts. And the bottom line is, if uh, this kullberg leibler divergence is very, very low, then you will have a very, very hard time of actually distinguishing those two distributions, whereas if you have a high kullberg leibler divergence, it's much, it's, it's much, much easier to actually separate uh, ILEX and Ts. So, this again shows that there are measures that, that are important. And what you can also see here, uh, this, this, this um, gray part um, of the graph, this actually um, shows you all the measures that we have identified as important with the other method. So these are the four measures, or these are the measures that, I, that I've shown you on, the, uh, on some slides before, and you see that uh, we get some similar results. Yeah? So we miss, some, we miss some measure sometimes here, uh, but in general, uh, measures that are good in the mutant information sense are also pretty good in this uh, KL sense. Again, you can, of course, evaluate the influence of the retention period, and again, you see very, very similar results. So what you see here is uh, uh, the same plot, or a very similar plot to, to what you've seen some slides before. So on the x-axis, we show the retention period in days, and on the y-axis, now you see the uh, kullberg leibler divergence, and again, you can see there's some kind of saturation effect after 90 days, so it doesn't really make sense to store more data than, uh, than, than this. Uh, in your statistical capabilities of distinguishing Alex and T's, you won't get, you won't get better. So let me talk about one last thing that we just started to, to work on a few, a few weeks ago. Namely, um, the question that we posed ourselves is now, if, if, our, if our T network knows that we're actually doing this analysis, yeah, are there strategies that, that they can exploit to actually, well, make this analysis useless? So can we come up with active strategies that will allow T's to somehow invalidate all our results, invalidate all our tests, whether it's possible to actually disguise as some kind of innocent person. Um, and actually, we started with, uh, with one simple strategy, and you can, of course, think of many, many others. Uh, uh, one was to employ a second independently acting cell. 
Yeah, so we have this huge network of ILAX. We add our real terror network, which is, which is this first copy of this 9-11 uh, uh, network. And then we added a second network, an identical copy, but it's not connected yeah, to each other. Yeah? We again made, made our simulations, and we tried to look what happens to the measure. So does, do the measures decrease or, or increase? And uh, it's very interesting to see that you get very different results. So what we did is we um, uh, committed actually the correlation of MIs yeah, between the case where we only had one terror network and the case where we had two of those terror networks that were independent and did not communicate. And what we show here is the correlation coefficient again for each, uh, for each, um, for each measure. And uh, what you would expect if, if, if the measures are good or, or if... Um, yeah, if the measures can actually detect uh, T's and duplicated T cells, that at least in the important measures, you should have high correlations for, for both cases. And, and, and as you can see from the graph, this, this didn't happen. Yeah, so for the important measures, again, uh, listed here with this, with, this, with this gray column, you see that the correlation yeah, between the case of one T cell and two T cells, so the measures of those two cases, are actually pretty low. Yeah, you, you see only in one specific measure, which is uh, yeah, kappa over IA, that has a high correlation, all other measures um, well, show almost no correlation. Yeah. So this means that this active strategy is actually pretty effective to, uh, to evade detection, at least using those measures that we have, that we have uh, looked at so far. So I think uh, this uh, should yield us to our conclusion. So what we try to do is we try to implement an independent evaluation platform, a platform that actually allow allows you to ask the question, well, does uh, telecommunication data retention make sense for, for uh, 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 proactive tasks? So is it useful in actually identifying bad people before actual events happen. Yeah? And what we've seen that is that there are some measures that you can actually use for this task. Yeah, there are some important ones, there are some unimportant ones, and you can try to analyze this using, using information theory. And um, what we've also shown you with those graphs is that the important measures do not depend on the particularities of, of the actual scenario. So there are measures that are actually stable over, this, over the population size, that are stable over the communication behavior of T's and that are stable over the data retention period. Yeah? And also, an, I think, interesting observation was that longer retention periods do not always mean better data. Yeah? As, you, as you saw from, this, uh, from those curves, sometimes it can be useful to actually restrict the period that you, that you, that you look at because the more data you get, the more, the more noise you get. And this, this is what you can really clearly see from those, from those graphs. And uh, there, we've also seen that there may be active strategies yeah, that, that, that these may employ to actually counter their identification. Uh, and we were actually very, very surprised that this very simple strategy of, of, of taking a second independent cell, and an, an identical copy that's not um, connected, does the job um, pretty well, at least what we've seen in our, in our graphs. So this brings me to the last and final slide. Uh, so we, we, we try to answer this, uh, the case whether, well, here in this, in this upper uh, lower right corner, we should put a, uh, 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 well, there was, this, there was this question mark on the slide that, that Kai presented. So the question was, is actually telecommunication data retention useful in a proactive fashion? So we've seen that in a, in a post-incident incident analysis, it, it can be useful, right? I mean, if you know that something that happens, you can actually look at who was it, what happened. But for a proactive uh, um, strategy, it seems that telecommunication data retention is very, very difficult to achieve or, uh, uh, because um, you, you actually have to solve some kind of needle in the haystack problem. You get tons and tons of data and you have to have some kind of statistical methods to actually pick out the right data. And this, is, this seems to be very, very hard. Yeah? And therefore, at the moment, uh, yeah, um, well, th there's certainly fur further research necessary at the moment. It's, uh, uh, we're inclined to say 
that uh, it's probably not useful uh, unless someone develops better measures or better analysis techniques. So, uh, thanks. This was uh, our talk. And I would, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, then uh, I'm happy to answer this. Hello? Yeah. Um, could you maybe elaborate on the agent-based model you used and assumptions about the behavior of the agents you used in the simulation? Sorry, could you rephrase? Um, you used an agent-based model, right? right? Uh, right. Could you maybe uh, give a short sketch about uh, how these agents were modeled? Well, so, <clears throat> is it on? Um, okay, so, I mean, this, these are just uh, uh, nodes in that network, and there is a queue, so to speak, of communications events, and when, which guy will communicate with whom. Um, and that is just, you know, worked through and stored uh, on the hard disk for later uh, analysis purposes. So the simulation, I mean, what, what, what you have to do is, I have to, you know, think about when will I communicate next, right? <clears throat> that is, uh, there's an underlying distribution to, to draw that event from, um, and then to whom to talk, but to whom to talk is given, you know, by the network, which we know, um, because we, we do so, so I mean, we, we play like God, right? We, I mean, we model the reality. Um, so we know to whom uh, these guys, that particular guy actually will talk. <clears throat> the only thing we have to draw is then, you know, the, the uh, information amount, but you can do that from all the published data to get the statistics, which you have to obey in the simulation. Uh, but, so the, the simulation itself is very, very simple. Um, the thing is you have, the, the real work is constructing a network that obeys all the statistics, and that was actually the most computational time here, uh, when we're talking months, not, not days, right? Um, but, but then the actual simulation, you just go through that, you throw a dice, right, and say, oh, yeah, now in five minutes I, I will do something, and then you just store that event on the hard disk. We had a couple of questions in IRC. Hello, yeah. Um, first a short one. Um, will you publish slides or a paper about this topic? So there yeah. is going to be a technical report that will contain all the details. It's not ready yet, but it will be ready hopefully in February, so, and it will be available from our homepages. So I mean, <clears throat> this, this is basically, or that was basically the outline of what we did. We have much more graphs, but I guess it was also already somewhat boring, but you know, you have to really dig into that, whether your simulation makes sense. That's the reason why we checked for all these consistency things, why we had this alternative approach, which actually is something that police wouldn't, could not do if they do not know who is a terrorist. So our alternative approach will be published in the paper in more detail, but it's just to validate that we are doing the right thing. Um, but that's so much, we couldn't present that here. And the second question, in your simulations, what distinguishes an ILAC from a terrorist? Sorry. Well, in our simulation, essentially, we, we decide, right? I mean, we, we set up a huge network of ILACs, up to one million people, and we try to model this network uh, in a way that it, that it conforms to all what we know from literature about real telecommunication networks. Yeah? And then, we, as, as a simulator, we put in s some of the T's. Yeah? So we, as, as uh, simulators, we know who is an ILAC and who is a T. Of course, in real world, you won't, you won't know this, yeah? right. but, but for our analysis, we can tell. So, and what we, what we have to add is actually um, that the connection of, I mean, there are connections between the terrorists and the ILACs, because, you know, a terrorist might call a pizza delivery service, right? So. Um, to model that, we assume that the terrorists communicate with outsiders like normal people would do. Right? They have sometimes a normal life. Even terrorists have you know, to call the dentist or something. Because if this wouldn't be the case, then, then you could easily see some kind of uh, clusters in the graph. Yeah. Yeah? You would see some disconnected parts of the graph that would immediately be uh, visible as... As which, RTs. Therefore, which, you have to have communication events as well between Alex and T's. Which means that we have chosen the, or the setup to be the worst um, for the terrorists, right? Um, otherwise, if we would have chosen that the communication between terrorists and ILEX is quite different, right? 
then it would be so easy um, to identify them because they are, you know, the outsiders or so. Um, so this is always, so the setup is always chosen in the way that it's, you know, the easiest for the police and the worst for the terrorists, basically. Um, I have a short comment. Maybe terrorist is very negative. I think <laughs> your methods might also be applied to any kind of social, political, or dissident or activist group. So, um, I mean, yeah, it could be that countermeasures yeah. are very useful and in more oppressive regimes, especially. So, yeah, terrorist is very negative. I agree, but okay. of course it was the motivating scenario. I mean, but this, yeah. of course, I mean, the, you're the, right. The rationale to introduce that in Europe was officially terrorists. Um, and you know that quote, right? Someone's freedom fighter is someone else's terrorist. So, yeah. Um, one of the questions is um, the T cell data that you have for 9 for 11, is it real? Is it like uh, really this single rooted tree with no interconnection yes, between so branches? So, so to, to be honest, I was not part of that plot. <coughs> so. I wouldn't know, but that is the official 9-11 report, um, and that it was, looks kind that of strange. Was, it looks like a yeah, single okay. chain so of command, like military. Well, I mean, you see, the thing is, um, if you do scientific evaluations and studies, you have to rely on published literature. That's the way, because that's the best information we had. But we had also the additional information from the Madrid thing, so which would be a different police. Mm -hmm. So you might probably be more satisfied. Mm -hmm because they might not be part of that conspiracy, but of a different conspiracy. And there's actually much okay, published the, uh, data about this out there. So if you, if you go to Google Scholar, then you will find probably 15 papers that somehow try to map the structure of, of several terrorist cells. And so we, we took one of, one of those of the literature, which is the most uh, um, reasonable thing to do, I think. Okay, another question is, the, uh, one of the most important things is to separate the important, me important metrics from the unimportant ones, yeah. right? And you use two methods to verify that uh, the metrics you selected are really important. Yes. And in the slide, um, can you, could you go back to the slide with the vertical uh, gray graphs uh, for the second method? You have kind of, um, no, no, no. This was the first method, but first uh, me, the second, okay, second method, okay. This yeah. yeah, this one. Uh, for me, it seems like you have four hits and three misses. How yes. is that a good result? Sorry. You have four hits. Sure. Uh, four metrics were uh, approved as good, as yes. important, and three weren't. And there is one metric that is good yeah, right. uh, in this scenario, but not good in the others. Well, this is, of course, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, but, but again, this alternative approach of validating that is something that the law enforcement could not do, because to do this, you have to know the identity of every person. Um, which you can only do in a post-analysis an thing. That is why some of the graphs also, for example, for the retention period, they, they are somewhat different, but the message is the same. Um, 90 days would most likely be sufficient anyway. Um, and the thing is, um, it's, it gives you the same impression, um, but it, it tells you if you know something after the fact, or if you look into that after the fact, um, this measure doesn't, isn't as relevant as you would assume from the first one, but that doesn't mean that you cannot employ it, right? You just have too much noise. So you probably put someone to Guantanamo who wasn't, you know. So as far as I understood, you um, gathered some data from other papers about the terrorist behavior. Can you tell us a little bit more on their exact behavior, like how are they communicating in difference to other people, so and what were your assumptions? The problem, Sorry, the problem with this is that, um, unfortunately, there is, at least we didn't find any, yeah? there is no published literature on the communication behavior of terrorists. So we know very well how, they, uh, how the topology looks like. So we know who is communicating with whom, but we don't know much about, about the, the temporal behavior. Yeah. But isn't the temporal behavior what you analyzed? Uh, well, not, well, it, it's, it's a mixture. So if you look at those, it, at those measures, some of those measures are topological, some, some of them are temporal, and some of them are a mixture. So wait, yeah? uh, I mean, the, the thing is, this is this what ex exactly the message of that slide. What probably I didn't describe it correctly. We do not know that field. So what we did is we introduced an an adjustable parameter for the simulation, not for the analysis, but for the simulation, to account for that we do not know that, and then we have simulated that for various values. Because 
police didn't know that either, right? So they would not know whether the communications, so the temporal, you know, how often, how frequent, how long, blah, 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 that is included in that factor. Um, and then we averaged over all the factors, or in some of the slides, it was actually, you know, um, put into different uh, lines just to account for that. But the message is always the same. So whenever they communicate like normal people, it's the worst, obviously, because then the signal noise ratio is just bad. But even if they are very, very different in their temporal behavior modeled by that factor, then still the same message holds. I mean, the, the quantities change, but their ordering and, the, you know, the, 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 the ranking stays the same. So, um, and that was, that was the only thing we didn't know. And that is the reason why we have chosen, as a police officer, what we need to do, um, that we do not know it. So we have just to assume, or hope, better to say, that the construction of our measures is not sensitive on that choice. And that what we also can show by some of the graphs where, uh, oh, well, it wasn't, it, yeah. So you see here, right? These are the three graphs for three different F values. And it's indistinguishable, right? So it doesn't really matter, so to speak, um, what, how, how they differ from normal people, in, in that sense, at least. Just, just um, two short ones because I probably missed something. Um, the first thing is I don't want to focus on the, the T guys anymore because I'm more astonished about how you found empirical data on T-free communication, if I may <laughs> say so. I mean, it's quite easy to find the, the Madrid guys, we have it, but where did you find the T-free communication? So actually, there's a lot of research out there that was originally targeted or meant for telecom operators to optimize the network. So they, like starting from the, from the, from the late 70s, they, they looked at how do people communicate? Yeah? Uh, how do the patterns look like? How much capacity do they need? Uh, and they did this in order to optimize their, their networks. Yeah? So to like, uh, provide uh, the required bandwidth, but not too much, because this would, of course, cost, cost them money. Yeah? So, so there's a lot of research out there. So we, we would assume that in the published data on huge networks, there are no terrorists, <clears throat> which is probably for the 80s true. And, you know, these two or three, I mean, if you argue that it is relevant that in the date, so in the overall statistics that we had here, there is, which we mimic, um, that there are still some terrorists present, um, it must be a lot of terrorists. Um, and then you would probably fall into um, the paranoia of, you know. Essentially arguing that there are not many terrorists. And it's uh, actually randomized, right? I, I hope mean, so. We, we, I hope so. Uh, we but on the other hand, no, there's empirical evidence, right, for that. Otherwise, I, during this talk, we would have heard a lot of <laughs> outside, right? Now you're talking successful. But um, just, just to get um, another point made, um, you, you mentioned police work. Police officers are normally um, yeah, handling quite different um, persons, criminals. Terrorists are probably criminals too, but... Um, well, Those are. might have less hierarchical, hierarchical um, communication structures because hmm? they are immersed in, in the public, probably. Yeah, yeah, is, there, probably. is there a chance well, this I mean, works with no, I mean, come normal criminals? I mean, you know, I'm not talking about um, car theft by chance, basically, right? So we talk organized crimes. And there is also published data in social network analysis journals, actually, uh, that the whole statistics basically holds the same because you, you end up with an organization. I mean, you will never ever have the single guy working independently. Um, but, I mean, whether it's a guy or, uh, organized in a drug cartel or in a terrorist organization, he has to order pizza, go to the dentist, and, you know, book a flight to somewhere, too. So that outside communication would necessarily be the same. Right? So it's only inside the community of, of whatever conspiring people that um, is different. Uh, so exactly what does that F value correspond to, or how is it expressed? What, what? The factor F that you mentioned oh, okay. earlier, what does um, it correspond to? That is the rescaling factor <clears throat> of the, the distribution in inter-call time duration. 
So, you know, how frequent do people give a call, access a web, whatever? And actually what's, what's, what's known from, from the literature is that those intercall durations have an exponential distribution, usually, mm. yeah? And this F essentially adjusts the parameters of those two distributions. So we said, in general, our T's communicate in a very similar way as ILAX, but only this parameter of, of, this, of this distribution actually changes. And this actually is some kind of worst case assumption, right? Because right. You, have, you have some very similar distributions, both for ILAX and T's, yeah? and still you are able, with some measures, to distinguish them. Yeah? So if you would use many, many different distributions, then the job would, of, of distinguishing them would actually get easier and not, and, not, and not harder. And therefore, this was our choice to say, we assume the same distribution, but only change the parameters by a, by a certain factor. Another question from IRC. How much uh, terrorist data do you have, and is it enough for your study to be accurate? Well, <clears throat> you might say that there are other mm -hmm. terrorist organizations, um, but again, there were, we have three different terror networks. Um, I do not know if there is any study present, say, for example, from the 70s terrorist groups. Um, these are all Islamic terrorists. Yeah. Um, so we, I mean, you know, we averaged over all those models, and so every, mm -hmm. every plot here was always averaged over all those terrorist networks, which, mean, which would probably also, you know, correlate to or mm -hmm. correspond to the situation of a software manufacturer, because he wants probably to sell his measure, analysis, whatever device in different countries. So the one was from Spain again, and the other from the US. Um, there might be other hidden ones that are much more clever, but what is the purpose of being completely hidden and not, you know, doing or so just implementing their plan. So just that's what some, we know. Just to give some numbers, um, the, the networks that we use vary ah. between 15, 40, and about 100 individuals. Yeah? So we have some kind of variability already right. there. But of course, 100 in relation to 1 million is a very, very small number, of course. And, but and this, this is reality, right? I mean, you're not going to have T cells that are huge. Yeah? So you will always have to you will always have this uh, needle in the haystack problem, yeah? And, and I would like to point out that this actually, the number or the size of the terrorist cell is the determining quantity that gives you really the, well, the upper bound of what you can do in these covariance measures, right? So we had these three-point measures. You cannot go to four or five people in a chain because you have not enough data for these T cells. You have enough data, you know, from the whole population, but the statistics is too bad if you only have a T cell of, say, 50 or whatever. Then, you know, there's a rule of thumb by which you can estimate what is reasonable, what is a reasonable measure or expectation value. And um, that is the reason, as long as a terrorist cell is small enough, that holds, if you grow to a size of, say, 100,000 terrorists, um, then you can do much more sophisticated measures, but then it's the question whether these people have actually to resort to violence, because if they are so much, <clears throat> they might achieve, at least in a democracy, better results without violence anyway, so. Okay, I saw even more questions out there, but we're over our time, so please come forward, talk to Kai and Stefan personally, and thank you. Thanks. Thanks.